The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. And there are different ways of teaching, different ways of ministering the Word of the Lord. And I feel this morning that we come with what might be called an expository teaching, or that we will exegete, as they say, this portion of Scripture of Matthew 18, verses 1 through 14. And what those highfalutin terms simply mean is that we're going to just sort of go verse by verse and reach down into each verse and, and draw out of it the inspiration, the illumination, the revelation, the counsel, the instruction, all of those things that, that God has birthed in our own spirit out of this portion of His Word. And, and just share that from our heart to your heart this morning that um, the Lord might speak to us in a fresh way, a new way, and a very blessed and, and wonderful way. Praise the Lord. Okay, in Matthew chapter 18 and beginning with verse 1, he says, At that same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now before we go further, just let me preface what we say with this. The subject of the first 14 verses of Matthew 18 is, Who is the greatest in the kingdom? And as we proceed through the verses we'll find that there are two characters. And you'll find these characters all the way through. And they're related to this subject of who is the greatest in the kingdom. These two characters, one of them is a child. And the other one is a man. And the child is the greatest in the kingdom. And the man is so offensive that he ought to be drowned in the sea. Okay? Now, those are the two characters. The child and the man. And the issue between those two is who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm not going to ask you this morning how many of you would aspire to being the greatest in the kingdom. I think sometimes that when we think of that, we think of the mother of James and John. And I'm sure you remember the story, how she came to Jesus and she made a request. And she said, Lord, grant to me that one of my sons, when you come into your kingdom, one of my sons will sit at your right hand and the other at your left. Now, the thing that this mother was after was a position for her sons that was greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's what she was after. Now, Jesus did not flatly deny her. In other words, he did not say that they would not be the greatest in the kingdom. He did say at that time that it was not his to give that. But it was reserved for those for whom it was prepared. Okay? And so he didn't deny that. But I think that you may think, as I have thought, that there was a little bit of selfishness, perhaps, or a little bit of ego, a little bit of grasping after power, a little bit of desire for recognition, you know, that was in the heart of this mother on behalf of her sons. And perhaps it may have even been in the heart of her sons. 
Now, I would say this, that if your desire to be great in the kingdom is a desire for greatness, then you can forget it. You'll never be great in the kingdom. But at the same time, let me say that it is not wrong to desire to be the greatest in the kingdom. If you desire it for greatness sake, then it is an ego trip. And no matter how persistently you pursue it, it will escape you. It will be denied you. You will never attain to it. But you see, the Lord gives us some qualifications. He tells us what the spirit of greatness is. He tells us what the nature of greatness is. He tells us what it means to qualify within ourselves for that position of greatness in the kingdom. And he also tells us that there is such a position. How many remember that the Lord speaks a number of times about those that are least in the kingdom? And then he speaks about those that are greatest in the kingdom. So there is that potential of winding up somewhere down the road of being the least in the kingdom or being the greatest in the kingdom. Now, that's not like one man told my father one time. He said, I just want to make it to heaven. He said, if I can just get one foot inside the door. And I'm sure some of you used to sing what we sang, you know, about a cabin in the corner of Glory Land. And, and some people wanted a cabin in the corner and other people wanted a mansion over the hilltop. You know? Well, that's sort of a carnal way of talking about the very thing that Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about going to heaven and living in a cabin in the corner or a mansion over the hilltop. But what he's talking about is finding a place in the kingdom of God, in the government of God, in the authority of God, in the dominion of God, by which we can be a blessing unto all people, unto all the nations of the earth. How many know that God is raising up a company of kings and priests, a kingly priesthood, to be a blessing to all nations? Isn't that what God told Abraham? He said, in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be what? Blessed. How many this morning desire to be a blessing? Amen? Amen? How many would desire to be a blessing not only to your children and your family and your neighborhood and your city and your country, but to all the earth? Amen? We desire that. Oh, how I desire it. When I read the newspapers and when I see the news on television and drive up and down the length and breadth of this land and travel in other nations, and see the ignorance and the poverty and the sin and the darkness and the sickness and disease and suffering and, and the hell that so many people are in. And there's something that cries out in me. Oh, God, enable me somehow by your spirit to be a blessing. To be a blessing. And God makes us a blessing. But it's on such a small scale in comparison to the need of the world. And so our desire is to bless. Now, let's put that together. See, if you desire to be a blessing, and if you desire to be a blessing in, in the ultimate potential of what being a blessing is, then you desire to be great in the kingdom. Amen? Amen? Because the greater you are in the kingdom, the greater is your potential to be a blessing. How many know this morning that the President of the United States has a greater capacity 
to do good for people than does the beggar down on the street corner. Huh? Sure he does. And the higher you rise in this world in positions of influence and power, money, uh, ability, all of those things, the greater is your capacity, your potential and your capacity to do good. See? So what I'm saying is that it's not wrong to desire to be the greatest in the kingdom if your desire for that is motivated by the true purpose of being great. If you catch a, a, a glimpse of the qualification for greatness, the spirit that uh, produces greatness, see, the nature that leads to greatness. If your desire is after those things, then you're fulfilling the requirement that the Lord lays down here for being great in the kingdom. Now then, we mentioned two personalities or two characters. One of them is a child who is the greatest in the kingdom and the other is a man. He's called that man. And that man is so offensive that he ought to be drowned. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Both of those characters are in you. Both of them is in you. The man, that man that is so offensive and so despicable and so abominable that he ought to be drowned, you look at that man every morning in the mirror. <laughs> Amen. It's that natural man. How many know that the natural man is enmity against God? The carnal man is offensive to God. See? That man is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It's a carnal man. But that child that has the capacity to be greatest in the kingdom, if you'll get away from your mirror, don't look in your mirror, but look down in the very deepest part of your being. You'll find that child. That child, that spirit being that dwells in you, that life of God that is in you, see, whether it's in you as a seed or whether it's in you as a life that is developing and growing up into something glorious in God, that divine seed, that life, that spirit that is in the deepest part of your being, there you will find that child who has the capacity to become the greatest in the kingdom of God. Okay, now notice what the Lord says here. The subject was in verse 1, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Well, that's a loaded question. And when you ask Jesus, you're going to get the right answer. So Jesus called a little child unto him, verse 2, and set him in the midst and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted or changed and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom. And I like to use, instead of kingdom, I like to use the word government. You will not enter into the government of God. Okay? To be in God's government, what do you have to be? Like a little child. Okay? To be in the government. Isn't that just the opposite from man's ways? I mean, how many men today would make a child president of the United States? We don't want a child in the White House. Jesus says, I'm forming a government. This government is going to rule and reign. This government is going to bless all the families of the earth. And unless you become like a little child... You ain't going to be in it. You'll have no part in this government unless you become, as a little child, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one of such little child in my name, 
receive of me. Now, I want us to understand that there's a difference between being childish and being childlike. Okay? Jesus did not say, except you become childish, you can't be a part of my government. He said, except you become like a little child. In other words, except you become childlike in your character, in your motivation, in your being. Except you become that way, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now then, what does it mean to be childish? Childish. What is that? Well, let me give you a few terms that equate with being childish. One is immature. Immaturity is childishness. Lacking experience is childish because children just don't have the experience. And lacking understanding is childish. Lack of knowledge is childish. Uh, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, the wise man said. You see? Now, maybe you were never foolish as a child, but I can remember some foolishness, you know? And, and that's what it means to be childish. But now, what does it mean to be childlike? In other words, what are the characters that Jesus is talking about? When he says, except you humble yourself. See? He's not talking about being irresponsible. He's not talking about being foolish. But he's talking about being humble. And having certain qualities that go along with that humility in a child. Now what is that? Well, a child is innocent. A child is not bigoted until it's taught to be so you see a child is innocent a child is dependent total faith in the parents to supply everything you know and and not not dependent in a negative kind of way but in that child quality that God ordained see for the nurturing and and, and the raising up of, of that child. Another character of childlikeness is that character of trusting. Of, of, of trusting the parent, of trusting the adult. You see little children jump off of a roof, you know, for the, for the father to catch them. And they're just trusting. I mean, man, they just believe that that father isn't going to let them hit the ground. You see many examples of that. And you know, when we're that way with our Heavenly Father, when we trust our Heavenly Father explicitly and totally and completely, the way a little child trusts its parents, I mean, how many children in a, in a normal home, loving relationship, how many children spend a lot of time worrying about whether daddy's going to get his paycheck? And whether there's going to be food on the table. And whether they're going to have a, a new coat to wear in the winter time. You know. How many children have to spend their days fretting and worrying and getting ulcers over those kind of things? No. They trust their parents. They know that their parents love them. They are their parents' child. Their parents are going to care for them. Mom and Daddy take care of all that stuff. See? See? And when we know that about our Heavenly Father, see, that's what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Your Heavenly Father. If you know how to give good things to your children, don't you think that your Heavenly Father will give good things to them that love Him? Amen? So trusting and humility and inquisitiveness, you see, all of those are, are attributes of child likeness. So the Lord is saying, if you want to be great in the kingdom, that is if you want to be able to bless 
a lot of people in a significant way, then you must become like that little child in your relationship to your Heavenly Father. And, and when we work this out in our experience to where we really trust our Father and where we are innocent toward all men and we view all men with the eyes of love, with the eyes of God, and when we are humble and inquisitive and, and growing and learning and we're yielded and we're pliable and we don't have preconceived notions but we're searching and learning as we go along when this is our relationship to our father then the qualities of greatness have been discovered in our lives hallelujah and it's through those principles that we will be enabled to enter into the government of God and become a great blessing to many people. Now, why is that? Well, let me say it this way. See, when you're able to trust God for all that you need and trust God with everything in your life and know God in all of His fullness as a child would grow up knowing His parents, when that is fulfilled in you, then there is a release into your life of the riches of His glory, of His wisdom, His knowledge, His understanding, His spirit, His nature, His ways, His power, His majesty. All of those things are released into your life. And when they're released into your life, then you can become a channel for them to flow out to humanity. Praise God. So do you see now why it is that in order to be great in the kingdom, you must be not childish, but you must be childlike. Amen. Okay, let's go on now here to uh, verse number 5. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Now, that's a tremendous principle. If you receive one such little child, one person that has that childlike relationship to the Father, if you receive that one, who do you receive? You receive Christ. And if you receive Christ, who do you receive? You receive the Father. Didn't He say, the Father is in me? And I am in the Father. It's not I that doeth the works. It's my Father that dwelleth in me. I don't speak my own words, but what I hear from my Father, that I speak. If you have seen me, you have seen who? The Father. Because I and the Father are one. So when you receive Christ, you receive the Father. But when you receive the little child, you receive Christ and the Father. Amen. Isn't that a glorious thing? You say, well, I don't know if I know a little child like that that I can receive in that way where I'll receive the Father and the Son by receiving them. Well, well let me turn it around to a way that you can, can grab a hold of it. See, when you become that little child, the Father and the Son are in you. And when you make yourself available in this world, when you make yourself available as the temple of God, as the tabernacle of the Most High, as a king and priest of His kingdom, as a vessel through whom the anointing and the spirit and the wisdom and the life and the glory of God flows, when you make yourself available that way, when you appear in that way, let me assure you that there are multitudes of people that will be glad to drink from your fountain. Amen? They will drink from you when you come as that little child that is greatest in the kingdom. And when they drink from you, when they receive you, what do they receive? They receive the Son and the Father because it's the Son and the Father that is in you. It's the Son and the Father 
that is in this little child. And the one that receives the little child receives the son. And the one that receives the son receives the father. So the little child is the ultimate conduit for the life of God to flow into humanity. Hallelujah. And that is the one that is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now then, just one other thing on that. You know, Jesus said one time, uh, He said, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Now, He was talking about that He was in prison and was visited and He was hungry and somebody fed Him and and he was naked and somebody clothed him, you know. And he said, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Now, in the religious world, the religious world thinks that that least one, the least of his brethren is the drunk out in the gutter and the heathen in Africa and the starving in India. Okay? And and so we have all kinds of relief organizations and and uh, benefits and, and, and social organizations and so forth to help the needy and to send food to countries where people are starving from famines and and uh, to help prisoners and to help all kinds of people. And, and the idea is that if you help the bum and, and you help the ignorant and you help the, the starving and the hungry and, and all and the heathen and everybody in the world, that you're doing it to one of the least of these, his brethren. Well, let me put it this way. We ought to do that. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm not a, a, against ministering to, to the drunk or, or to the starving or, or to the dying or the hungry or the needy anywhere. That is part of the gospel. And we should do that. But that's not what he's talking about. See? When he said, he said, when you do it to one of the least of these, my brethren. See? My brethren. Then you have done it unto me. Well, this, these that are his brethren are members of his kingdom. See? We're talking about the government of God. We're talking about sons of God. And the least, in this sense, is also the greatest. Because he sets a child in their midst. And says, except you become as this child, you can't enter and be the greatest in the kingdom of God. So you see, as we touch that little one, that little one, that humble one, that sensitive one, that tender one, that yielded one, that trusting one, that one that knows his father as that little child in that childlikeness of faith and simplicity and yieldedness and obedience and, and, and growing and developing in the family of God. See, when you bless that one, then you are blessing Christ. Because that one is the vehicle of Christ is the temple of God in this earth. Hallelujah. Okay, let's go on now. Verse number 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe unto that man, woe unto that man by whom the offense cometh. Okay, now, now notice the term that man. Woe unto that man. We told you there are how many characters in this story? Two. One is... The child and the other is that man. Thing. Well, he's offensive. 
Okay? So the Lord says, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, it were better for him that he were drowned, but that a millstone was put about his neck and he was drowned in the sea. And woe unto the world because of offenses. So where do offenses come from? They come from the world. And who is that man? Well, that man in one sense is the world. Or that man is the natural man. The man that is enmity against God. The carnal mind. Human reasoning. Our own way. Our own understanding. See? All of that is that man. So woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. <coughs> okay, we'll stop there for a moment. Now what does it mean to offend one of these little ones? How many have ever been offended? <laughs> okay, now I'll tell you what that means to the average American anyway. I think to, to the average human anywhere in the world. In English, offense means... To be hurt, to be angry, to be resentful, to be bitter. In other words, if, if, if I offend somebody, how am I going to know that they're offended? Well, usually because they're hurt. And they may be angry. But they're certainly resentful and oftentimes bitter. So to us, offense is uh, sort of an emotional thing. You know, you stepped on my feelings. You said something I didn't like. You did something that I don't appreciate. And that hurts me. And I resent that. And I get bitter about that. And my bottom lip sticks out. And I get a scowl on my face. And if I see you coming down the street, I'll cross over to the other side and make believe that I'm window shopping so that you won't know that I know that you're coming down the street. See? I'm offended. I'm hurt. My feelings are hurt. See? And I go to a pity party. And I want to tell you something. When you go to a pity party, God doesn't show up. And the sons of God don't show up. <laughs> Amen. Neither God nor His sons show up when somebody goes on a pity party. Okay. Now that's what it means to be offended in English. That's not what He's talking about. He's not talking about somebody that hurts your feelings. He's not saying... Uh, but whosoever shall hurt the feelings of one of these little ones. Because I want to tell you something. If you're greatest in the kingdom, your feelings are going to be pretty stable. <laughs> Amen. If you're in that relationship with God of that little one, of that child, uh, your, your, your feelings aren't going to be sticking out there too far. So it's not that. But you see, in Greek, here's what the word means. It means to trip, to snare, to cause to stumble, or to cause to fall. In other words, he's saying that anyone who is taking the place of that little one, of that child of humility, of yieldedness to God, of brokenness before God, of trust in God, if anyone does something so detrimental and so drastic and so dastardly that it would trip that one, that it would snare him, that it would cause him to stumble or to fall, or that would turn him aside from the goal that he has before him in God. Anyone that turns that one aside Woe unto that man.
For it is better for that man that a millstone were put about his neck and that he was drowned in the depths of the sea. And I want to say to you that every one of you that are here today have met that man. You met that man. You saw him in the mirror this morning. See, that man is not your neighbor. See, that man is not your boss. That man is not your mother-in-law. Or your father-in-law. See? That man is not your peers that put the pressure on you. See? That's not who that man is. That man is the carnal man. Because the carnal man is enmity against God. Your own natural human reasoning, your own carnal desire, your own way your own program, your own design, out of your own carnal heart, that is the man that always wants to trip, snare, stumble, and cause this little one to fall. That's the man. See? Woe unto that man. Because out of that man comes the whole world system as we know it today. See? And all the system of this world is hostile to the ways of God. Everything in this world system is moving upon principles that are absolutely diametrically opposed to the Spirit of God, to the ways of God, to the nature of God, and to the will of God. Now then, I want us for a moment just to look at this a little further about the offense. Um, over in chapter 16, Matthew, just flip back a page or so. In chapter 16 and verse 21, we see a classic example of what our Lord is talking about. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Okay, what was the Lord beginning to reveal to His disciples? His crucifixion, that He was going to suffer, and He was going to die. Now, this was a traumatic word for these men. Because they had all their hopes pinned upon Jesus, that He was the Messiah the king of Israel. He had come to deliver their nation from the Roman yoke. To deliver them from all of their enemies. To sit upon the throne of Israel. To become the king. To subdue the nations. And bring this glorious kingdom of God to pass. And they trusted in him that he was the one that was to do this. And now this glorious king says that he's going to go up to Jerusalem and he's going to be despised and he's going to be mistreated and he's going to suffer and he's going to die and he's going to be buried and he's going to the grave. So what was their response to this? Well, it says then Peter took him. You know, Peter the impetuous. He took him and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine that? Can, can you comprehend with me this morning that here is Simon Peter, the old fisherman, rebuking the king of glory. He began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. In other words, he's saying, Lord, no way. That can't be. In fact, he was saying, We won't allow it to be. We will not permit it to be. And you know, Peter still had that spirit the night they came to get Jesus. Remember, he pulled out his sword and cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. Boy, Peter was all ready. He was ready for that final battle. And to slay the enemies and, and to bring the kingdom in by the sword. And what did Jesus say to him then? He said, put up your sword. My kingdom's not of this world. My kingdom doesn't work the way 
the kingdoms of the world work. We don't win our throne by the sword, by killing people and maiming and, and halting and, and destroying and bringing scourges of hell upon the earth from bombers and, and, and guns and, and implements of war. He says, our, my kingdom is not of this world, else would my servants fight. Put your sword up. That's not the way it's done. But what did he say to him here? When the Lord began to rebuke him. Okay? But he turned, that is Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. In other words, if Peter was audacious enough to rebuke the Lord, the Lord was audacious enough to call him the devil. He said, He said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of who? Of man. See? So he called him Satan. Satan simply means adversary. Well, what was, what was he an adversary of? What was Peter an adversary of? He was an adversary to the will of God in Jesus' life. See, it was the will of God that Jesus suffer. It was the will of God that Jesus die. And Peter was saying, no way, Lord. That's not going to happen. We're not going to allow that to happen. See? And whose reasoning was that? It was carnal reasoning. It was human logic. It was natural inclination. See? To do that. And there is the strength of Satan. There is the power of Satan. It's in the carnal mind of man. The mind that wants to do it my way. You know, we like that song. I did it. My way! And Peter saying, best of all, Lord, you may talk about the cross, but best of all, Lord, the bottom line is, we're going to do it our way. Amen. And our way is Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. But we miss something. Anybody notice that? We miss something. Notice what he said. He turned and said, this is verse 23 in chapter 16. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Had you ever thought about that Jesus could be offended? That the Son of God could be offended? Do you think that means that Jesus' feelings were hurt? Do you think Jesus went out and had a pity party? Do you think maybe Jesus snubbed Peter for a few days? You know, just sort of got cold. And wouldn't look him in the eye and you know, I mean, isn't that how people act when they're offended? But see, that's not what it means. It means to trip or to stumble, stumble or to snare, to turn aside. What was Peter trying to do? Trying to turn the Lord aside from the path that God had marked out for him. And he was just trying to do it. See, Jesus didn't say, get thee behind me, Satan, because you're full of devils. He didn't say, get thee behind me, Satan. You're all mixed up in New Age philosophy. See? He didn't say, get thee behind me, Satan, because you have a crystal ball. He didn't say, get thee behind me, Satan. You're all mixed up in New Age philosophy. See? He didn't say, get thee behind me, Satan, because you have a crystal ball. He didn't say, get thee behind me, Satan, because you talk to the dead. You're a spiritualist. You're a channeler. You're in some demonic thing. You're out there in, in gross darkness. You're a Satan worshiper. No. No. He said, you're an offense to me. You are Satan, Peter. 
And as Satan, as an adversary, you're trying to turn me aside from this childlike walk with my Father, whereby I am totally obedient, totally yielded, totally humble, totally with my face set toward my Father, trusting my Father that even if I die, that I will rise again, that nothing can destroy me. I've got this faith, this confidence, this relationship with my Father. I'm willing to suffer because my Father wants me to suffer. I'm willing to die because my Father wants me to die. And here you are trying to turn me aside to another path to sonship. An alternative path to the throne that is a product of carnal reasoning. He said, you savor not the things of God, but those that be of, not the crystal ball, not the Satan worshipers. See, not the seance, but the things that be of men. Just common, good old boy, everyday corn-fed logic. See? Just human reasoning, human understanding, I did it my way. See? That's what it is. That is an offense. The only thing that can turn us aside... From the path that God has marked out with us and trip us and stumble us is that carnal thing that rises up as it did with Jesus in the wilderness when he faced that temptation of Satan. If thou be the Son of God, do it this way. Do it this way instead of God's way. Do it the natural way, the carnal way, the human way, the earthly way. Figure out a program. Get a good system going. Say, just figure it out and do it the logical way instead of doing it by the Spirit. Amen. Now then, we could spend a long, long time on that, but I, I just want to mention this in, in passing. You see, we all have this test. And, and we have it every day. Whether we're going to do it God's way or whether we're going to do it our way. God's way can only be done by the little child. And your way is done by that man. That carnal man that deserves to be drowned in the sea. That has set the whole world in motion. Woe to the world because of offenses. <laughs> See? This whole world system is, is uh, mitigated against the way of the Spirit of God. Now then. See, we, we, God, God can arrange all kinds of tests. God can even send prophets. See, the Lord told me to stay home and write, and I travel very little. In fact, most of my ministry outside of El Paso is in Duncan, Arizona, and Gallup, New Mexico. <laughs> That's about the only two places I go, really. And I used to travel everywhere, all over the United States for many years, and, and a number of foreign countries, ministering everywhere. And the Lord said, son, sit down and write. Stay home and write. And, and God gave us a ministry in that. And as soon as I knew that I knew that I knew that I'd heard from God, suddenly every prophet that came through El Paso prophesied to me and said, Yay! Thou shalt travel more than thou hast ever traveled. <laughs> And most of them prophesied this to me just a little bit before their next convention. <laughs> and I mean it. They tried to prophesy me to their conventions to be speaker. And, and they tried to prophesy to me to, to go here and prophesy to me to go there. And I want to tell you, you know, the Bible says, let the prophet speak and let the other judge. How many believe that prophecy needs to be judged? Huh? Sure it does. Because if I did everything prophets told me to do, and if I went everywhere that people have told me the Lord told them that I was supposed to go, brother, I'd be a mess. I mean, I would be a mess. 
One brother told me years ago, he said, Brother Evie, he said, the Lord showed me last night that you're going to Alaska. I said, well, praise God, brother. I said, if I go to Alaska, it'll be the Lord. <laughs> Amen. And, and so the prophets began to prophesy. How many remember that place in the Old Testament where all the, the spirits were gathered around the throne of God and God said to them, Who will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of my prophets to deceive this king? Huh? And how many know one spirit stepped forth and said, I will? <laughs> and God sent him and prophesied lies through that prophet. Was the prophet a man of God? Come on now. Was he a man of God? Or was he a loony off the wall? No, he, he was, he was a, a man of God, but he was prophesying lies. Why do you think God tells you to judge? Huh? What I'm saying is that, that you can be set up by anything. Anything. Natural or even that which appears spiritual, but comes out of the carnal mind. See? Amen. So, and then another thing that, that I've had to deal with, you know, years ago when we came into ministry and, and just, the Lord told us to, really, well, I didn't know it at the time, but it was in a sense this childlike thing of just trust and dependence upon the Father. Because the Lord would never allow us to ask for money. We publish a paper, we publish books, we never, ever send out a letter saying we need money. And yet every bill is paid every month. And sometimes God blesses, blesses with a overflow. You know? And, and we've never had to ask. Now I'm not saying that it's wrong to ask. I'm saying that God told me not to ask. Okay? Now I believe that God does have people ask. And I'm not against collection plates or, or marches or anything. But I'm telling you that God said to me, you will trust me in this completely and explicitly. And I will meet your need. And you will never ask for money. And then the Lord said something else. And He said, son, you will never use your ministry or the mailing list that you have of my people across this country and around the world to promote any business proposition or any financial deal. Okay? In other words, I could never start up something or get into some multiple marketing program or something and use our brethren that love us and support our ministry to draw them because of their love for us and their trust for us to draw them into kind of a business deal so that I could profit and make money. God said, son, you will never do that. How many times do you think I've been tested on that? I mean it. Just a couple of weeks ago, a sister sent us a thing. She said, I just felt that you might be interested in this. And man, I could see the potential in that thing. It, it wasn't a multi-level thing, but it was a similar kind of gimmick. And, and you know, immediately the thought came into my mind. Man, if, if I would just send this out to everybody on our mailing list, you know, I, I, I probably in a year or two I could retire. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as the thought came, I had to turn just like Jesus did to Peter and rebuke that thing and say, you're an offense to me. See, God told me how to do it. And, and again, I don't put all the brethren to this. And I'm not against multi-level marketing or any kind of business. I'm, I'm ooh, capitalist. <laughs> I, I was in business. Okay? And, and I, I'm, I'm for business. But I cannot use my ministry or God in my life to promote a business for my own end. I can't do that. Now, He might would allow me to do something like that under some circumstance to bless somebody else. But I cannot do it to my own end. And so this thing came. And the thought came. Man, you can make a men out of that. And I said, you devil. 
You Satan, you adversary, you're an offense unto me because you don't savor the things of God, you savor the things of men. I heard the voice of that man. And that man deserves to have a millstone put around his neck. He deserves to be drowned in the depth of the sea. That carnal man de- uh, deserves, see, to be put away out of our sight. To not be considered. To not be seen. To not even be in the picture. Amen. See, God wasn't against Peter. God was just against that carnal mind that was speaking through Peter. And it was an offense, not because his feelings were hurt, but because Peter was trying to turn him aside. Okay? Praise the Lord. So I trust we we see how this thing works now. Um, he says, let's go back to chapter 18 here. And he says, um, But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, And then he goes on and talks about that man. Now then, let's go on down to verse 8. Oh man, we got to wind this up here. Okay. Verse 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off. And cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life, that is the life of God, halt or maimed, Rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire, or Ionian fire, the processing fire of God, and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, it is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Now, I'll be honest with you, I read that scripture for many years. I read the commentaries. I heard everything that religion has to say about it, and I still didn't understand it. I finally came to the conclusion that it just meant just what it said, that if your right hand offended you, it was better to cut it off and go through life with one left arm than than to be cast into the judgment fires of God, you know, uh, to deal with that thing in you. It'd be better to do that. But how many know this morning that we are the body of Christ? And how many know that Jesus, or or rather the Apostle Paul, talks about in in Rome, in 1 Corinthians, about the the body of Christ as members, as the eye and the foot and the hand and so forth. See? Okay? Now now this sounds drastic, but I want you to think with me for a moment. Just just think with me for a moment. Listen to the the voice of of the Spirit here for for a moment. See, my hand is not this. That's not my hand. And my eye is not this. And my foot is not down here on this red carpet. That's that's not where it is. But all of these members are members of Christ. Are members of the body of Christ. Now you say, brother, maybe that doesn't sound right. If my brother is a foot, or my brother is an eye, or my brother is a hand, am I just to cut him off and cast him from me? If he offends you. And again, I'm not talking about hurting your feelings. And have anything to do with somebody gossiped about you. Or somebody falsely accused you. Or somebody mistreated you. Or somebody cheated you. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if they try to turn you. If their effort is to turn you by carnal wisdom. From following the spirit of God. And fulfilling the call of God. And the purpose of God in your life. Which is the most important thing that your life will ever know. If they, by carnal wisdom, are turning you aside, he says, cut them off. He's not talking about damning them. He's not talking about hating them. He's not talking about mistreating them. He's not talking about having an ugly spirit toward them. He's talking about 
putting up a barrier between you and them where they cannot turn you aside from the purpose of God. I pray for them all. I love them more than they could ever conceive that I love them. But I cannot walk with them and allow them by their carnal programs, carnal methods, carnal ideas, carnal doctrines, all their man-made philosophy of religion to turn me aside from the path that the Father has marked out. I have to say to them, as the Lord said to Peter, who was one of the greatest apostles, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, because thou savorest not the things of God, but those that be of men. Amen? Now then, that's true on that level, but it's also true on the individual level. Because anything in you that would detrimentally affect your vision in God needs to be cut off. Anything in you, in that man that's in you, that would turn your foot aside from walking in, in, in the way of the, of, the, of the Lord needs to be cut off. Anything that would affect your service in the kingdom of God and turn you aside from fulfilling that ministry and that service to humanity, to creation, to God's people, anything that would affect that, that's in your own mind, your own heart, or in the church, or in the world, or anywhere, he says, cut it off. In other words, bring a break. So that you do not walk the way that they're trying to prescribe for you. You can't walk that way. You can't do it that way. See? That's why I'm not down at the First Baptist Church this morning. Because I can't do it that way. That's why I'm not down at St. Mary's or St. Joseph's or whoever it is here in, in, uh, in Gallup. I'm not there because I can't do it their way. See? I have to do it my father's way. So I'm not there. And I've got another news for you. They ain't going to let me in anyway. <laughs> See? But there's a break. Are they in the body of Christ? Sure they are. Are they saved? Yes. Are many of them filled with the Holy Spirit? Do some of them have gifts of the Spirit? Do they love God? But they still think like men. They do. Still think like men. Their program is man-oriented. Their creeds are right out of the carnal-minded interpretation of the letter of the Word. See? So, he says, cut it off. Okay, let's go on now. Uh, verse number 10. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Now I've heard a lot of carnal minded preaching on this. And basically in two categories. That everybody has a guardian angel. Now then, I don't deny that. I believe there are guardian angels. So I'm not against guardian angels. But at the same time, I don't believe that's what he's saying. When he says, they're angels. In other words, we used to think that every little child had a guardian angel and their guardian angel was up in heaven looking into the face of the Father. I mean, isn't that what it says? They're angels in heaven. Do always behold the face of the Father. And then the other interpretation was that it was their spirit. That the angel was the spirit of the little child and, and, and that when little children died, that their spirit went up to heaven and, and gazed into the face of the Father in heaven. See? Well, now there may be some truth in both of those. I'm not saying there's no truth there, but I don't believe that what, that's what he's saying. You see, angel means messenger. An angel is a bearer of a message. And the word angel is used as often of men 
as it is of any kind of celestial being. Many, many times in the scriptures, it means a message or a messenger. The message and the messenger are one. Now then, what he's saying is, don't despise one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven, well, where is heaven? We talked about that the last time I was here. It's the realm of the Spirit. It's the realm of the Spirit that God dwells in. And when you are in the Spirit, you're in that realm of the Spirit. And that is heaven. I'm seated together where? In heavenly places. Or the Greek says in the heavenlies. In Christ Jesus. I'm not going to heaven. I'm in heaven. See? Now they're, they're angels... He says that in heaven, in the realm of the Spirit, there are angels or that message that they bear, that message that they are, that word that is in them, in the realm of the Spirit. That word that is right out of the bosom of God, out of the heart of God, out of the mind of God, that's by the Spirit of God. The message... That is in these little ones. The word that is in them. In the realm of the spirit. Always beholds the face of who? The father. Hallelujah. In other words. Those who are the little ones. Look only on the father. They see only the glory of the father. They desire only the will of the father. They're yielded only to the way of the Father. And that is the message that they bear. And that is the nature that they are of. Glory to God. Amen. And, and where is this happening? In the little one who is humble and dependent and trusting and yielding and obedient to who? To the Father. And always gazing into the face of the Father. And only bears the word of the Father. And is in the realm of the Spirit where the Father is. Hallelujah. That little one that is greatest in the kingdom. Okay. Now we've got to close and we're going to do it right here. In these next three verses. Okay. For the Son of Man. Now notice the word for. See, for is a connection. Between what he just said and what he's getting ready to say. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Now we talked about it in the Sunday school this morning. What it means to be lost. You know what the church world thinks lost is? Eternally damned. They say, man, you're lost. They mean you're going to hell and you're going to burn forever. You're lost. Do you know what it is to be lost? How many have ever been lost? When you're lost, there's three things you don't know. You don't know where you are. You don't know how you got where you are from where you were. And you don't know how to get back to where you were from where you are. Okay? In other words, you just don't know where you are. And you don't know how you got there. And you don't know how to get back. If our gospel be hid, it is hid from those who are lost. In other words, it's hid from those who just don't know where they are. They don't know why they were born. They don't know why they're here. They don't know what God's purpose is. They don't know that they came out of God. They don't know how to get back to God. They don't even know that they're supposed to get back to God. They're just lost. See? And weren't we all that way? And you'll never be that little child that knows the Father and trusts the Father and yields to the Father and obeys the Father. You'll never be that little child until you're found. See? You have to be found. So he says, for the Son of Man has come to, to save that which was lost. How think ye? I like that. How think ye? That's a wonderful expression. 
If a man have a hundred sheep, and how many of them? How many? And one of them be gone astray. Doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? Okay, and if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine that were not astray. Okay, now we got to remember this. He's still talking about the little one. How many know that the little one can be turned aside? If the little one could not be turned aside from following on to know the Lord, then he wouldn't say, woe unto the man that offends them. Because that's what offense is, is turning them aside. So now he says that a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost. One of them goes astray. One of them is turned aside. How did he get that way? Because he was offended. Something or somebody, either within himself, and it's always within us, even if it comes from outside. See? Turn him aside. See, we used to think that this was talking about humanity. That it was the starving in India and the heathen in Africa. They were the one lost sheep. And the bum down the street and, and, and the sinner man and, and the people out carousing around and committing adultery and, 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 and lying and cheating, uh, they were the, the one lost sheep that was going astray. I want to tell you something. If they're the one lost sheep, if they're the one lost sheep, then the 99 is still in the fold and that means that that God has way more than a lost. But how many know that's not the way it is in this world? How many know that God's flock is what Jesus call it? Fear not little flock. See? God's flock at this point in time, ultimately He will be all in all. But right now, His flock is a little flock. And the masses of the world, the heathen in Africa, the starving in India, the unconverted, the unregenerate, the worldly, you see, all of them, they're the masses of the world. So there's no way that those masses of unsaved out there are the one lost sheep. That's not the one lost sheep. No. The one lost sheep is one of these little ones that he's been talking about all this time that gets offended and turned aside from following the Father. And... And you say, oh, that's a terrible thing. Yes, it is. Because that man that offends that one is worthy to be drowned in the sea. See? But what, what is God's objective about this? Let me ask you. Peter offended the Lord. How did Peter wind up? He wound up one of the greatest apostles. He was the one that stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached that great sermon to the multitudes in Jerusalem. He was one of those that turned the world upside down. So what is the father's attitude toward that little one that goes astray? Ah, oh, he goes after him. Amen. He goes after him. And he searches for him. And he searches for him until he finds him. And he brings him back. And there's more rejoicing over that one. Amen. Now how do I know that's what he's talking about? Let's read the next verse, 14. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And who are the little ones? The one that he set out in the midst and said, except you become like this, you'll not be greatest in the kingdom. The little ones are the greatest in the kingdom. The little ones are the sons of God that all creation is groaning and travailing for. For their manifestation to bring deliverance to creation. Hallelujah. And there's, let's capsulize it this way. There is something in you today and something in me. It's the carnal mind. It's the natural man that always wants to turn that inner son, that little one, that spirit life that's in us, wants to turn it aside from fulfilling the will of the Father. And everything in the whole world and most of the things in the church world also are mitigated against 
that little one. Against that spirit of sonship that would rise up in God to become the blesser of all nations. The redemption of the world by the power of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So there's that is the warfare that we're in right now. It's between that man and the little one. But even if you get turned aside, I got news for you. The Lord's going to follow you. He's going to pursue you. He's not going to lose one. And He's not going to lose one on that level. And He's not going to lose one on the other level. Of the masses in India and the heathen in Africa and the unregenerate that make up our nation. He's not going to lose anything. But right here, He's talking about that little one. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. How many have almost been offended sometimes? <laughs> almost turned aside. Amen. And what nearly turned you aside you saw in the mirror? Or maybe it was in religion? Or maybe it was in the world? Amen. God's going to get you. God's going to pursue you. God loves you. You can't get away. You may think you can, but you can't get away. Amen. If you're ordained for this hour, you're His.